Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. Really pleased to have Nigel Lewis with us today. Nigel is the CEO of AbilityNet, amongst other things. Nigel wears multiple hats. Uh, I know he's also involved heavily in the IAAP um, and is also um, part of the, the steering committee for the Digital Accessibility Alliance. So, Nigel, I'm really pleased to have you join us today. Um, it's good to have uh, pretty much the, the largest pan-disability charity uh, in the UK represented here. So can you um, tell us a bit more about AbilityNet and the work that you're doing right now? Yeah, so thanks, Neil. It's really great to um, be asked to join uh, AXChat and uh, really looking forward to the conversation. So um, for those who don't know, uh, AbilityNet is a UK-based charity. We've existed for probably just about 30 years, helping disabled and elderly people with accessibility needs within technology. That's all we've ever done and all we've ever focused on. Um, if we go back to our origins, we started by uh, focusing on helping people with their desktop needs, so how to make their PCs back in the day um, more accessible, either through whatever was in in the box, so with Windows back into Windows 3.1. Um, and now we help people with their PCs, their laptops, their mobile phones, their television, about how to make that technology more accessible and inclusive for them. So either with the, the, the assistive technologies that are built in or by recommending them other assistive technologies. Uh, and we do that for people who are at home um, in work or in education. And then probably about 15 years ago, we branched out into perhaps what we would be terming today as accessibility. So um, we, we built, if you like, a consultancy and we provide consultancy to organisations to help them with their accessibility needs for their web, for their mobile training and processes. And we also provide um, free advice and information. So we run a, a free phone number that anybody can call us and ask us about some of their accessibility needs or their assistive technology needs. Um, and we provide in-home support to the disabled and elderly for their IT needs as well. So we, we have quite a broad, comprehensive range of, of services that we deliver from AbilityNet. That's great. And I, I've, I've known AbilityNet for, for a fairly long time, um, having done some work doing um, accessibility testing for, for Robin Christofferson way back in the day um, and, and known some of your localised centres. Um, what was it that brought you to AbilityNet? Because you, you joined AbilityNet not, yeah. not too many years ago. Um, yeah. And, yeah, thanks um, for what, that. What, 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 <laughs> well, I meant that I, I've known AbilityNet for even longer, yeah. so I've, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of showing my own age here. Um, yeah. So what, what were your motivations to it, and, and how did you get involved in the field? Because it, we are in a fairly small, although growing niche. Yeah, yeah. So, well, so my, um, my career before AbilityNet was um, working for big IT services companies. So I've always, always worked for IT or in the IT space. But I guess the real thing for me is I... I have a severely disabled son. Uh, he's, I'm really going to age myself now. He's going to be 30 this year. You can say I don't look it, it's okay. Um, but uh, so he's severely disabled and I've seen over the years how technology has helped him. So uh, I pretty much had enough working in the IT commercial space myself and was looking for a change. And uh, it was one of those fortuitous moments. I think I was looking through the Sunday Times, you know, the, the appointment section in the Sunday yeah. Times just for Christmas, um, which was probably back in 2006 because I joined AbilityNet in 2007 and there was the job. So I applied and they gratefully gave me the job and I've loved it ever since because it is it is probably one of the, oh, I'd have to say no, it is the best job I've ever had because we, we do really change people's lives every day just by helping them to improve how they use their technology. And it can be often the simplest of things that can make the biggest impacts. It's amazing. And yeah, I, I think everybody that we interview has some kind of personal hook into mm. um, motivation for working in the field, um, whether that be familial or, or through experience or, or through their own, sort of their own disability. Um, yeah. And I think that that's why 
people that that we interview are so massively motivated as well because everyone that we talk to is is hugely motivated to make a difference. Right? Yeah, it's sorry, I was going to say it's it, it's a benefit and it's it's also a, in some ways it's a disbenefit if you see what I mean because we have great passionate people that are touched by it somewhere True. either through friends or family yeah. but. We've got to re one of our key challenges is we've got to reach out to the people that aren't touched and therefore yeah. don't get it. And there's still far too many of those people out there who don't really appreciate or understand the power of what the technology can do for that disabled or older person. And just it's not because they're they they're doing it by malice. They're just doing things by ignorance or not including accessibility and doing a lot of that simple stuff. That would make it so much more inclusive. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And certainly, when when I'm talking to business, we tend to avoid the the language of advocacy, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm trying to talk in the language of business and business metrics and, and why it's important to roadmap mm -hmm. stuff and, and 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 really addressing it as these these are your customer needs rather than this is a discrete accessibility issue. And, and, and frame it in, in the, the language that the business understands rather than in the language of, of, of accessibility because it's very niche, it's, it's particularly technocratic and, and, um, and, and I think that perhaps we've done ourselves a bit of a disfavour because we, through, through that enthusiasm, again, we're, we're very, very passionate about it but we're not necessarily um, communicating, as you say, to the wider audience and, and, and we need to be talking in the language of the people that we want to be addressing it going forwards, which is everyone, because it is an issue that's going to affect masses of people, especially as the population ages. Yeah, I mean, the target audience for what we do is huge. I mean, um, and that's sometimes the challenge because there's so many people you can reach out to and help. Um, but I think getting that key you know, concept across. Actually, it's not just for disabled people or not just for older people. It's it actually what we do helps everybody, and it makes you know the websites, the apps, the content. It's easier to understand, navigate, digest. So yeah, we need to think in bigger terms. And I think sometimes I think the word accessibility holds us back as well. I don't know. I don't particularly have a better solution. I kind of flip between inclusion and accessibility, but. I don't know, mainstreaming what we do and making sure that people understand it's a key component, of the whole usability piece, yes. um, I think is absolutely critical. Yeah, I, like, like you, I quite often use inclusive design. Mm -hmm. um, I think that nitpicking, and, 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 and I, I know that you, you're also a friend of Sandy Wesmer, who was a guest <laughs> the, the other week. Right. Um, we, yeah. we, we nitpick between inclusive and um, Universal design. I think that inclusive is is realistically achievable, and, and that sort of universal design is is a li little bit more of a pipe dream in that in that respect. So I'm trying to use the the language of something that's that's achievable, where we're thinking about um, thinking about the needs of people. Now it may be that the product or the service may not meet the needs of everyone, but at least you're going through that that thought process. Yeah, absolutely. I quite agree with that. And I, but I think the language that we use is so important because I think part of the issue that we as a, if you want to call us as an industry or a profession face is we all use slightly different language to mean slightly different things. So we send, we tend to send a confused message as well. So it gives people an out, you know, well, I don't really understand because A says this and B says that and it's all very confusing. So I think as a, a profession, if we could really get our act together and get our language straight, then I think we could help ourselves to get the message across. I always, I, I always use a very simple example. If you ask most people, what does global warming mean? They could give you the basic answer. Ask people what accessibility means and you probably get a whole variety of basic answers that don't mean the same thing. And we need to kind of get to that kind of, if we're going to be a movement for change and making things inclusive, then I think we've got to get our act together in that as well. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good point, you know, commonality of understanding. At the moment, accessibility may, may mean connectivity uh, to some yeah. people in their minds. Uh, it's, well, I can get to the website, I can hit it, look, yes. the page is loading. Yeah. It's fully accessible. 
Yeah. It's got a really great Wi-Fi signal. Well, that's not quite what I meant. Um, so, yes, yeah. we, we do need to find that common language, and certainly that's something we see. I contribute to, to the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines through W3C, mm -hmm. and that, it is a minefield because you've got all of these different countries. Um, and when you start talking about disabilities and you're talking about cognitive dis disabilities in particular, the, the language used varies tremendously from, from country to country. So it's, it's, yeah. it's yeah, and you've got all the, yeah. Sorry, you've got all these passionate people. You know, we go back to what you said earlier. You know, yeah. we're all here because we're immensely <laughs> passionate and like, this is how I want it to be phrased. But so we've got to find a way, I think, of coming together. And this isn't just in the UK. I mean, this is or in Europe. I think this has to be this global movement. We've got to come together and we've got to just sort of somehow nail it that we have a very clear, consistent message that we can all then take out to all the people that we come in contact with. And I think that could be quite transformational. So I'm, I'm, and I think that one of the routes to maybe get into that is, is the IAAP. In, in mm -hmm. It's uh, the first professional body for the accessibility profession or nascent profession. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're heavily involved in that. So can you tell uh, us a little bit more about the IAAP and, and what it is aiming to achieve? Yes, definitely. So um, IAAP, the International Association of Accessibility Professionals, um, We've existed probably for about a couple of years. There were 30 original founder members, of which I'm proud to say AbilityNet is one. Um, and membership is growing. We have a, approximately 1,000 members today, and everybody is welcome. Um, though you do have to now pay a small fee. Uh, you missed the free membership period for the last year. Um, but I think there's some real key elements of what um, the association is trying to do. So it, it's very much about trying to create this professional community. So it's about allowing members to communicate and share their knowledge, or you can ask questions through through the forum and the platform that the IAAP community has. Um, it's about sharing, as I said, not only just sort of between members, but also sharing knowledge. So members have been doing webinars. So there's a regular monthly webinar that people can attend uh, and, and improve their knowledge and understanding. Um, We've, they're also going to run, if you, I think, which is the, which will be the, a global um, conference on accessibility, and it's going to run in October this year, 21st to the 23rd of October, uh, over three, so over three days uh, in Las Vegas. Never been, so I'm looking forward to la going to Las Vegas. And I think the other key thing is around the professionalism. So it's going to build a certification program for all people working or touched by accessibility. So it's quite broad. So we're not aiming the certification just at the accessibility consultant like the web designer or the tester. It's going to be a broad um, program. So it will give that accessibility professional their credentials, but also it will enable, say, project managers or people in governance or marketing to also get a level of understanding and professionalism. So the first module is, is currently being built. I know there was a group working on it last week, building up uh, the body of knowledge and, and what would form this entry level um, qualification. And the second module, which is going to be web accessibility, is currently in planning. And therefore, we'll get those two done and hopefully up and running next year. And then there'll be other modules coming. So it's very much about building this profession. I'm not saying people who don't work in it today aren't professionals but it will give them the formal recognition that they deserve, plus it will help employers to understand that um, you know, they're backed up by a recognized qualification. So we will be professional like people in the security industry who, in IT or project management in IT or Microsoft certified it, and, and the list goes on. So we will, through IAAP, create this real uh, recognized accreditation. I think that's really important because certainly when I'm out recruiting, it's very difficult to tell without uh, without actually sitting someone down and, and and walking them through stuff, whether or not they they really know what they're talking about or they're you know, they're throwing buzzwords at you. So um, so I, I'm I'm all in favour of of having a good 
well recognised qualification and a foundation for for professionalism because I think it's something that the industry needs as we as we mature. The yeah. other the other thing that I think is also of, of interest to me is um, how we look at things like the UNCRPD um, because I think that that is something beginning to get woven into metrics that businesses are using. Mm -hmm. So, um, as an example, ASOS, my employer, are reporting on the, the Global Sustainability Index, which is um, GSI, and the latest version of that, with the work of the Onsay Foundation, um, actually starts asking companies to report on accessibility related to UNCRPD. So, I think that, that again, you're, you're seeing a movement towards something that is globally recognized. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I'm hoping that um, you know, what gets measured gets done. <laughs> yeah, we hope so. Yeah. But I think the more we can use some of these global in, you know, initiatives that ties it up, because most, most technology is global these days. It doesn't just live in one country. You know, the website's available to anybody. So I think the more we can back these true global initiatives and get, them, get the awareness raised of these, because I'm sure there's still not a lot of organizations reporting in such a way using the UN CRPD, for example. So I think the more we can do to promote that would be really helpful. And then they would know that they're doing it against a recognized process and standard yeah it's, it's a recognized framework so, yeah. so um, the GRI uh, um, gives you that framework and mm -hmm. it's mapping it to the to the uh, CRPD Antonio you have a question uh, I have um, a question we're talking in, in, uh, about you know, global reports you know over the last I know, months there was you know, Facebook Twitter quite a good number of companies they they publish reports about diversity and then we look, when you look to those reports you only see ethnicity and gender so you don't see anything else and it's quite mm -hmm. it reduces you know reducing diversity to that it doesn't make any sense so I would like to see your views and and how you know the importance of, of improving that type of report in order to include you know, uh, how can companies inc publish reports where they also express the diversity of the workforce in relation with people with disabilities because actually that's a very important topic to be on those reports. Yeah, Antonio, I, I quite agree. I mean, certainly here in the UK, we obviously have the nine protected characteristics within the Equality Act of which disability is one. So I don't know whether we, I haven't really done a comparison between other countries and whether we're doing any better or not, I don't know. I know one of the things that we, we try to do in AbilityNet, which is about trying to promote the whole awareness thing of accessibility, we, we, um, we produce a range of what we call sector reports through the year where we'll take us like the retail sector, travel industry, etc. And we'll look at the top few uh, companies and sites in those sectors to try and it's not to, you know, browbeat or criticize anyone but it's just to try and raise some of the profile and the issues that people are facing so we'll do some user testing and some checking of their websites and just try and give them some guidance about you know what's the transport sector or the retail sector like and would people with disabilities um, or inclusion access issues be able to transact and engage and it's um, it's still quite Worrying, I guess. I don't know how many years we've been at this. It seems like a long time that, you know, still a lot of issues out there that people face. I mean, I think it was just before Christmas last year, we looked at the top five supermarkets just to see if somebody with a disability could buy Christmas dinner online. And out of the five, only one would have probably been able to complete the transaction to buy dinner. Um, so, you know, still lots to do and to encourage people to look at yeah, this inclusion accessibility more um, more earnestly. But I have to say, I don't know about you guys, but I think there is definite shift in the number of organisations and um, the movement of accessibility, if I can put it like that. We, I'm definitely seeing lots more organisations talking about accessibility, uh, looking to implement accessibility, sometimes still a bit too late in the process, needed a bit more upfront 
uh, right at the beginning. But there does seem to be a bit of a groundswell, um, more than I've experienced previously. I don't know if you guys agree with that. I think I'm seeing that certainly in business. Hmm. Um, I belong to the Business Disability Forum Tech Task Force. There are a number of new members. The people that are engaged tend to be more engaged now, I think. Um, and, and there are things happening where, where again, we're using collective bargaining power to address uh, address the issue. So, so we're going collectively as all of these businesses saying we all want it. And I think that the fact that there are these dialogues taking place and other companies can see that it's important to their peers or their competitors is is starting to create some kind of momentum. I think we're still, you know, a long way to go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're sort of rocking the big boulder at the top of the, at the, top of the precipice, but, but it, it's rocking. So yeah. I, I, do think, I do think that we are, we are making some progress, and I think there is definitely renewed interest. From what Deborah's saying, in, in, in the States in particular, um, the changes in legislation um, over the last 18 months and the, the upcoming changes as well are having a significant effect in terms of what businesses are doing. And regardless of whether we think it's right or not, what happens in the States obviously has a, a huge impact on, on everything else in the IT industry especially. Mm. Because yeah. like I said about software, you know, pretty much everything's driven out of California. <laughs> even 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 if the software companies are based elsewhere, that they're interacting with other companies in Silicon Valley. So mm -hmm. what happens in the States is really um, of, of great importance. So to see that trend, positive trend, I think is is is, is encouraging. Mm. Yeah, well, it's good to hear that you're feeling that as well, because I that's certainly the feeling I'm I'm getting. But you're right; it just needs a lot more. I also wonder, kind of in the UK, whether you know one of those unintentional consequences of the government's digital by default strategy. I'm sure they never thought about it when they put it in place. Uh, we'll keep that just between us, right? Um, but uh, you know, building some accessibility now into some of the digital services, they still got a long way to go as well, but. Uh, at least, at least it's on their agenda, which is really good. Yeah, and, um, and one of my most retweeted tweets is actually the link to um, gov.uk when their digital inclusion strategy, because they've actually got a link that says it is illegal to, uh, you know, produce a public website that is inaccessible to people with disabilities. Mm. So, so that message is there. I keep pushing it out because I think it's really important for people to see that the government and, and the arm of government is talking about this. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think the GDS have have done a good job. There's more to do, as, as I mm. think both know. Um, but they've 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 taken things further than any other um, public mm. sector body in in any country that I know of in terms of. Being upfront and stating it is it, one of the, re the requirements. You know, they've got their ten core principles, and, and one of them is build for inclusion. And I think that's yeah. important. It is very important. Yeah, especially you know, digitising 600 plus services um, for probably most people who have a disability or the elderly, they've got to get it right. So, and we've got to just help them stay on their case to make sure they do it. Yeah. Uh, no. What's our, 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 your views in the way how they communicate? No. That no. Sorry, what, say that again, Antonio. Uh, what What are your your views in the way how they communicate, how they pass that message, uh, in terms of GDS? Are because sometimes you know I, I'm trying to find someone trying to lead this conversation, and I'm not able to find anybody. Yeah. So um, they used to have a somebody, Josh, wasn't it, who was in GDS, who um, who was head of accessibility. I'm not sure they've actually replaced them, or they've just replaced them. Um, I'm a bit out of touch with that, but they... Uh, they'll be replacing, they'll be putting the adverts out this week, I think. Oh, OK. Ben, you know, ben Terrett will be tweeting about it uh, shortly. Uh, there you go. So I haven't missed it. That was good. No. So I think if, you know, it's good that they're going to replace someone, and then hopefully they can do be far more proactive. I mean, it's conversations that happen through their stakeholder group uh, that they have for digital by default, and then also the assisted digital programs. But they could certainly do more to be you know, 
really showcasing and advocating digital inclusion. Uh, there's some great examples in government of uh, accessible transactional sites. Um, and it'd be nice to see them shout louder just on the accessible, you know, we have managed to build this inclusively rather than, you know, we've just managed to make this new service. So it'd be nice to see if we could um, encourage them to do that. Okay. Uh, one of the things that, that concerns me about the whole digital by default agenda, um, and, and I'm engaged with GDS in talking about this as well, so um, is the, the idea of digital tyranny. <laughs> the, the, the prospect that um, people actually enjoy face-to-face -face communication, yeah. uh, particularly older people, because right. actually uh, you used to go to the post office on a Wednesday, and I'd be cursing because I'd have to you know, buy my tax list. Well, GDS has sorted that bit out, but also removing the collecting your pension yeah. bit um, is removing social interaction. So um, one of the concerns that I have about digital by default is actually how we're going to counter the whole thing of, of loneliness uh, and exclusion through the facilitation of services that, that are online that people are able to use, but it's going to have a knock-on effect in terms of people's health, because loneliness is, is particularly detrimental to people's health. Yeah, you're right. But, I, you know, and we don't want to lose the, the post offices and the libraries no. Uh, and, and, you know, the church groups and all the other groups. But I think, um, you know, technology can play a part, you know, it has some good parts to play and it has some bad parts. So, yes, it could take away the need to go to the post office on a Wednesday to get your pension. But you could argue it's probably it could be a bit more secure that, you know, you, the bad people in the world know that you're not going to go on a Wednesday and you can go go different days to collect the money from your bank. But the good part of technology can be to improve, you know, people's ability to communicate. So, you know, if you're at home isolated and your family, you know, we live in a very, dis, you know, in a world where families are spread around. We, we don't tend to live in very tight knit communities where, you know, generations of families never move. We're all on the move because we're so mobile, socially mobile. So technology can improve that communication as well. So I don't think it's, you know, there's a bit of bad, but there's also a lot of good, you know, things through Skype and Facebook and all the other sort of social media interactions that exist um, can enable people if they can be encouraged to use the digital technology. They don't find it too scary. And I think that's that's the challenge. We've got to stop pe telling people, oh, you've got to email. You know, you've got to learn email because, you know, people can't see the value of emailing. But they might see the value of seeing the pictures of their grandchildren or researching the history of their family or, you know, they've got an interest in this type of hobby. We've got to change that landscape of how we skill people up to be far more focused on what it is they want to do. But the challenge is reaching those isolated people because they're isolated today before the technology arrived. Um, and there's a risk it could get worse slightly. But I think the benefits, if we could get it right, um, and there's an army of volunteers out there to help. You know, AbilityNet has some volunteers, but loads of other charities have volunteers. Loads of corporates are doing lots more around, you know, the whole digital champion program. You've got Barclays doing stuff, Lloyd's, Post Office. I don't know if that us, you guys do stuff. But if we could harness that power of all these volunteers who are willing to help people use technology, and we could reach these people who are, pretty much isolated and probably don't see anybody for a, a week or more and reach them. You can't expect them to come to us. We've got to go to them and try and encourage them and help them. There will always be people that won't use it. My mother will be a prime example of that. Can I get her to take broadband and use technology? It was bad enough when she got a TV with FreeSat built in. Um, no, she never will. But there's lots of people that we can help and support if we can find a way of reaching them. Uh, about about uh, pro probably two years ago, I start. Um, I, I was organizing an event here in, in Cork that was connected with with, uh, with the social good event being organized by Mashable. We, we organized a sort of a, a conference, and at the end we had a epic session for people who were asking questions. And what happened at, at the end? That people asked, "Oh, we would like to know how to use technology. Who can facilitate that for us?" And after that. Uh, I was able to join with a group of people, and we end up doing that in a in a internet cafe here in Cork. And mm -hmm. when we started the sessions, we 
uh, they were asking me, oh, uh, are you going to give us a program? Or we can ask you what we would like to learn. Because we, in the past, we were asked to go to some classes, but they were just dictating what we were supposed mm -hmm. to learn. We want to learn this. We don't want to learn that. So yeah. and then I end up adjusting my classes to the requirements. Though They wanted to know if they out could... Uh, they don't didn't want to know how to send emails. They wanted to know how can I identify if this email from my bank is a secure email. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to be able to uh, communicate with my friend in Australia, and I want to be able to set up my computer to be able to see her. Where should I put my computer? They, they wanted things that they don't really fit sometimes in the standard programs that trainers and organizations think they need. Yeah, exactly. So that's all about tailoring it to what the individual wants. People don't necessarily just want to learn how to do email or generically surf the web. You know, here's Google or Bing, how, you know, type in a question. Well, but what question? People have interest generally. As you say, it's talking to their friends or family. It's uh, knowing how to stay safe. Um, thinking about whether they perhaps want to do internet banking because they can't get, you know, getting to the local branch or it's closed, so it's not there. It's got to be really tailored about what their interests are because I think we've done all the easy people, you know, they've all gone, you know. It's, it's the harder to reach people who haven't touched the technology. Three and a half million disabled people in this country, uh, I think, are not on the internet. So, you know, we need to... Um, really focus on them and their needs rather than thinking this is how we should teach, you know, I want to teach it this way because it's easy for me. Yeah, I think that's very true. Uh, my mum is a great example of someone that basically stopped using technology when she retired. Mm. Uh, my dad's the opposite. You know, it's always been on the computer, on Messenger, sort of, yeah. So interested that it's kind of annoying, but yeah, it's good <laughs> anyway. But um, for, for my mum, the thing that got her back interested was video calling. It was FaceTime or Skype or, or yeah. you know, it's it's the you know, the fact that they that they're seeing some benefit. There's something in there that, that's of interest yeah. to them, and that's how we get the hook in. I think we need to be looking for what it is that people are interested in, and not trying to prescribe it because that prescription never works. They've remained disinterested this far. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to force you to do it because they're they're ambivalent to the technology in the first place. So why would we create, manage to teach them to do email if actually they've got no value in doing email at all? So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, just as a quick plug, uh, if we're getting near the end, this, this these sorts of things are something that we um, we promote and recognise through our Technology for Good Awards, which are coming up in a couple of weeks. It's a programme we, we started and it's in its fifth year. And it's looking for that technology that, as it says on the tin, is helping in a good way. From the lady who ran a fish and chip shop doing an internet cafe to some doctors who created an app to um, use the iPhone to... Um, uh, be able to analyze uh, blindness and uh, eye complaints in Africa on the cheap basically, and do that remotely. You know, there's some amazing technology going out there. We just look to promote it. So, yeah, um, I'm familiar with the awards there. Uh, yeah. there's, there's some good stuff. Yeah. There, so happy, yeah. happy to leave the plug in. Yeah, <laughs> the fact is, if you want to give us um, your, your helpline number and the mm -hmm. link to the awards, we'll put that in the... Um, We'll put that up on the site as part of the um, the agenda for tomorrow, so that people can see it. Mm -hmm. um, Happy to. So that would be great. So I think we've reached the end of our half hour. Uh, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure um, and really interesting. So thank you once again. No, thank you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you both. Thank you, Nigel.